as Jungians and as psychoanalysts, that's one of the things we assume, that when something is unconscious, it exerts a disproportionate amount of influence. By becoming more aware of it, then we can become more choiceful around it, perhaps. Or at least it becomes an object to consider rather than kind of a subterranean engine that's pushing us right and left. And then once they recognize, oh, this stems from this desire that I was unaware of, that you know, they can they can still feel it, but they're more willing to ignore it. So I think maybe, maybe in terms of the feeling, I don't know how much control we have, but in terms of the actions we take, maybe we do have a bit more agency over. And you know, I've likened this desire for status to something like hunger, where all of us to varying degrees experience hunger, the intensity kind of varies from person to person and how much we desire it varies food i mean and and it's the same with status i think you know i think it does kind of fall along that normal distribution where the intensity of that desire uh is different from person to person um you know i think for someone like me you know i'm i'm interested in studying it and and uh uh my my guess is people who are interested in studying something like this probably have a higher than average desire for it um <laughs> <laughs> and and others don't. You know, I, I noticed this with um, you know, my friends that I grew up around uh, from back home. Of course, like they they experience their own versions of status games and so on. But it's not nearly to the same extent um, as I see among more kind of educated people. Uh, although it's it's more subtle, it's 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 pervasive. So. So it seems like this is something we can become aware of. Mm -hmm. What that awareness will do remains to be seen. Will that deconstruct the potency of it because as Jungians and as psychoanalysts, that's one of the things we assume mm. that when something is unconscious, it exerts a disproportionate amount of influence and we justify it or we barely recognize it by becoming more aware of it, then we can become more choiceful around it, perhaps, mm. or at least it becomes an object to consider rather than kind of a subterranean engine that's pushing us right and left. So in one way, being aware of anything makes us have a little bit more room, breathing room around it. I think that's just right. I've I, spoken. Yeah. No, go ahead, Rob. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, I, I've noticed this with, with uh, people who become more aware of this desire for status that, you know, the especially overachievers who are prone to burnout, that they say yes to everything and they're, they want to get every award. They want to get every... Um, piece of recognition they possibly can. And then once they recognize, oh, this stems from this desire that I was unaware of that, you know, they can, they can still feel it, but they're more willing to ignore it. Right. Um, so right. I think maybe, maybe in terms of the feeling, I don't know how much control we have, but in terms of the actions we take, maybe we do have a bit more agency over it. Exactly. I think that when we, um, okay, I'll just finish this thought. Yeah, Lisa, yeah, yeah. But, Go ahead. Um, when we become what I think Joseph is pointing to uh, is when we become aware of something and it's in consciousness, then we can choose. So, okay, I was really driven by this desire to um, get the Chamber of Commerce award or to buy a different kind of car. Once I'm really aware of what that's, where that is in me, then I can say, oh, wait a minute. Uh, as Joseph said, it becomes an object. It's out there. I can, I can walk around it a little bit, look at it. Uh, and then say, well, I don't know. Um, maybe I don't really need that. Maybe it's the it can affect our our choices. And um, altogether, one hopes it is basically freeing us mm -hmm. into more awareness, more wholeness. Um, and whether that leads to a lot more money, like the person you were talking to in New York, or whether mm -hmm. that leads to, you know. Um, I think I'll go out and, uh, you know, sort of water the vegetables in the garden. It, mm. it can, we have choices. I can choose. I'm not grasped, uh, gripped by, by something uh, like that underground engine Joseph was talking about that just runs things. At, at least that's the hope. Yeah, I'm, Joseph, I think you've raised something really interesting, and we obviously all have a lot to say about it. I wanted to link it to the idea of kind of persona and shadow, because, uh, and I, I appreciate, Rob, your framing about these different kinds of games. So if we're playing, um, you, you said there was, a, there was a virtue game and an achievement game. Let's say we're, yeah. let's say we're playing the achievement game, 
Mm-hmm. So what we've identified with, what's um, to use that psychobabble term, uh, kind of egocentric, which it feels right to us, uh, that would be what what is in the persona, how we want to how we want others to perceive us. So I'm very diligent. I work really hard. I win the awards. I'm smart. I'm competent. I'm focused. Whatever. But there's also always something that's going to be in the shadow that we're going to disavow that's going to be the kind of opposite of that. So that might be, well, I'm, I'm grasping and I'm, um, you know, petty and I'm mm. cutthroat or, or whatever might be the sort of shadow side. So if you think about it, maybe the, the virtue stuff, well, I'm, I care about the environment and I care mm-hmm. about diversity and I care about other people, but what's in the shadow is, you know, maybe, you know, it's really important that people see me like this and I'm going to vie for being the, the most virtuous. And even if that means I'm going to have to cut some other people down. Or, so, mm. so I think it's, it, you know, I really appreciate the question you asked, Joseph. It's like, well, so what can we do about this? Mm-hmm. And I think if we, if we translate it into Jungian terms, one of the things that we can do is say, all right, so so virtue is important to me or achievement's important to me or power is important to me. Okay, that's okay. And what's going to be left in the shadow that I might then act out unconsciously or project onto other people? So I think we're talking about the various ways that these insights might be applied in terms of our personal self-reflection. Yeah. How we might try to create some sense of balance and, and mm. put something into our hands in terms of consideration. Mm. I think as Jungians, one of the things that we're also very interested in is that differentiation between the authentic self and then the values that we are colonized by. And, and in an ideal analysis, that begins to become really apparent. So I don't know that infants are born with a natural sense of status per se, but there is a certain kind of competitive desire to thrive. And if we're in an environment where thriving or the ones who are thriving have certain statuses, there is something deeply instinctive that says, well, I'm going to thrive if I identify with this group versus the group that doesn't seem to be thriving. If that was demonstrated with something other than status, we would then be attenuated to those things, you know, people with a certain hair color or certain a physical build, all of which, depending on the environment you live in, is something that's, uh, that's noticed for sure. But often we are looking for any evidence of what the structure of the personality is underneath that. So I'm wondering that in your own process, because your book is autobiographical. And so something inside of you prompted you to examine how you became the man that you have become. And often when we do that, it's because we sense there is a secret in the narrative that we haven't quite put together, we haven't quite found. And often that secret is something that is more authentic, more true than the trauma we've been subject to, more authentic than what we've been colonized by. And in order to make that separation between who am I really versus what's been done to me, who am I really versus what's colonized me, then it still leaves that important question of who am I when I separate out these other things? So this is a personal question, Rob. Having done this investigative work, Mm. what parts of the most authentic Rob have, have clarified for you as you've become aware of the impact of these various things? Huh. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's uh yeah, that's difficult to say. Um you know, as as I as I was writing the book, um 
you know, it's, it's so so writing memoirs is, is, is challenging because it's still telling it's still storytelling and you still have to give the reader a sense of coherence and you can't just tell one story after the other of this happened and then this happened and so on. It has to sort of have a connective tissue throughout so that the reader doesn't get lost or, or keep asking, well, what's the point of this? Why are you telling me mm. these stories? Mm. Um, one thing that became apparent to me, uh, well, I guess there were, there were two. Uh, one was that I, I was always kind of a curious kid. Um, I had always been interested in abstract ideas and, um, I had this thirst for knowledge, um, for information, for wisdom, and uh, I was in this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, intellectual drought in these environments, mm. in foster care, and, and then later in this working class town that I had grown up in of, you know, my friends that I had around me, um, you know, they were, I was probably the most academically inclined uh, among them, and even I <laughs> was just barely passing my classes. I graduated high school with a 2.2 GPA, C minus student. Um, and I think a part of me uh, was maybe uh, afraid of that um, mm -hmm. propensity of that I was a pretty bright kid. Um, but if I acknowledged that about myself, then I would have had to raise my sights for my future. And I just, you know, I didn't feel uh, worthy somehow of it. And uh, there's, there was a story I left out of the book, actually. So very early on, uh, shortly after I uh, enlisted, I arrived at my first duty station in Washington State. This was McCord Air Force Base. Um, my uh, uh, supervisor noticed my test scores and my just general enthusiasm. I just threw myself into the job and I was doing very well in terms of the training. And he suggested to me that we put a package together, an application to maybe um, for, for essentially for me to apply for the Air Force Academy uh, and sort of fa get fast tracked into becoming an officer. And this is like, you know, it's very rare for a young enlisted kid to be offered something like this. And I was I think I was 18, maybe 19 at this point. And, and I just said no. <laughs> like, I didn't even think about it. I was like, oh, no, thanks. Like, I'm good. And, um, you know, it's funny, just I made the right decision by enlisting, but then threw away this uh, opportunity uh, simply because I just didn't feel mm -hmm. worthy of it. And I didn't really I felt like, oh, I've I've all it was something like I've, I've already gotten pretty far. Like the fact that I made it through all the training, I'm doing well right now. Right. Maybe this is about as good as I can hope for. Maybe I've sort of reached the ceiling as far as what I'm capable of what I could hope for myself. And maybe some part of me thought I didn't even deserve that. Um, and then, so, so I, I, I declined that. And the other was just, uh, the, the other lesson I suppose was, you know, through, through authoring those early experiences all the way up till fairly recently. Um, I could pinpoint the moments when I actually exerted some agency, uh, and made my own decisions. And realize that, you know, there are all these uncontrollable forces that govern our lives and that, yeah, we, you know, they're, 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 there is limited control that we can exert, but there is some, it's not, it's not zero. And I can tell, oh, that was a moment when I made a decision and, and it went well. And there, there was a moment where I made a decision and it went poorly. Uh, and so that just reinforced for me that, that. That's still it's it's true, not just for these stories that I'm telling in the book, but also for my actual life right now that I can exert some some agency and and not just feel subject to external forces. Mm -hmm.